to uh, Rick Hughes for providing music for our worship today. We're going to begin with our opening hymn, Glorious Day. And the words will be up on the screen if you'd like to stand and sing aloud.
First reading is a reading from the book of Acts, chapter 10, verses 34 to 43. Then Peter began to speak to the Gentiles. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is, what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did both in Judah and Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses, and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him, in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. The word of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank A reading from the first letter of, of Paul to the Corinthians. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn receive, in which also you stand, through which you also are being saved, if you hold 
further to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I hand it unto you as of first importance, what I in turn have received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I work better than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. And then Peter and the other disciples set out and went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple had ran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrapping there. They did not go in. And then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth at the head of Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. And then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in. And he saw and believed. As for yet, they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. Aunt Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she bent over to look in at the tomb. And she saw two angels in white. Sitting there where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. And when she had said this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know him. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing he was the gardener, she said to him, Sir, you have carried him away. Tell me where you have laid him, so I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and she said to him in Hebrew, Obani which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I am not yet sent to the Father. But go to my brothers and my sisters and say to them, I am ascended to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. And Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Please be seated and go to the point our young people are now marching.
We all know our faces show how we feel. Sometimes we try to hide it, hide it but we're not always so great at hiding how we feel. Today, we don't want to hide it. As I tell the story, we want you to hold up a face, have the people in the story feel about what was happening. Let's get started. It was early in the morning on the first day of the week when some of the women went to visit the tomb where their friend Jesus had been buried. He had been crucified and died on the cross. It was a sad face to show. Thank you. 
imagine ourselves with the disciples on that first Easter Sunday. Here's what we heard. At dawn, before the sun had risen, some women who were part of our movement went to the tomb to properly wash Jesus' corpse and to prepare it for burial. When they arrived, they had a vision involving angels. A woman of women claimed that Jesus appeared to her. The rest of us think it was just the gardener. The gardener. What a place to be buried. A grave in a garden. A bed of death in a bed of life. The women came and told the disciples. And Peter went running back and he found the empty tomb. The burial plots were still there, neatly folded. Who would take a naked corpse? and leave behind a bloody cloth that was wrapped in. Peter wondered what was going on, but he didn't have any clear theory about what had happened. We all speculated, but none of us could think. So we all decided to go back home. And that's where we are now, walking the road to a maze. It's about a seven mile walk to our new town. It takes a couple of hours. And along the way, we're talking about all of this, trying to come up with some kind of an interpretation of the events that have transpired. And now we know that this other fellow walking towards us. He's a stranger, so we lower our voices and he comes a little bit closer. What are you folks talking about, he asked. And one of us replied, are you kidding? Are you the only person in the whole region of Galilee who doesn't know what happened around Jerusalem lately? Like what, he asked. And we tell him about Jesus. That he was clearly a prophet who did sin such amazing things. We tell him how our religious and our political leaders came together to arrest him. And we go into some detail about the crucifixion on Friday. We had hoped, one of us says, we had hoped that Jesus was the one who was going to turn everything around. That he would set us free from Roman occupation. We walk on a few more steps and he adds, and this morning was the third day since his death. And some women from our group told us that they had seen visions of angels and that he was alive. It's pretty clear from the tone of the voice that none of us really took the women seriously. That's when the stranger interrupts. You don't get it, do you? This is exactly what the prophets had said would happen. They've been telling us all along about the liberator who had to suffer and die and didn't enter into glory. And as we continued walking, he started to explain these things from scripture. It begins with Moses and step by step he showed us the pattern of God working down through history, accumulating on what happened in Jerusalem in these final days. God calls someone to proclaim God's will. Resistance and rejection follows, often accumulating in the expulsion or murder to Sodom's speaker. But this isn't a sign of defeat. This is only a way of God's most important messages being heard to someone on the verge of being rejected. God's word doesn't come in dominating or crushing force. It only comes in vulnerability, in weakness, in gentleness, just as we have seen in this last week. So at this point we realize we've reached our house and we slow down but the stranger keeps on walking. And we plead with him to stay with us for a while. Since it's getting late, it'll soon be dark. So he comes in with us and he sits down with us. And at our little table, and he reaches across and he takes a loaf of bread. He gives thanks for it. He breaks us, brings it and gives each of us a piece. And in that instant, it heals. This isn't a stranger. This is, it couldn't be. This is Jesus. We look 
inspired. Yes, it felt like our hearts were just glowing within us. Hotter and hotter until it was just about ready to ignite. Did what happened was it real? Was it a vision? Just a vision? Maybe a vision means that we're seeing things more real than anything else ever before. But it wasn't just me, right? You saw it too. <coughs> what do we do now? Shouldn't we tell the others? Yes, let's do it. Let's go back to Jerusalem. Even though it's late, I could never sleep anyway. I'm just too excited at our experience now. So we pack up our gear and we rush back to the city, excited and breathless. And in our earlier journey, we were perplexed, disappointed, confused, saddened. But now we're filled with another kind of perplexity, wonder, awe, ah, amazement. Almost too good to be trueness. Do you realize what this means? One of us asked. And then he answers this question. Jesus was right after all. Everything he stood for has been vindicated. Yes, and something else. We never need to fear death again. And if that's true, another says, we never need to fear Caesar and his forces again. Their only real weapon is fear. And if we lose our fear, what power do we have left? Ha, ah, death has lost its sting. And that means we can stand tall. And we can speak the truth just like Jesus did. We never need to fear anyone ever again. And this changes everything. It's not just that Jesus was resurrected. It feels like we too have arisen. We were in a tomb defeated and despaired, but now look at us. We truly are alive. We talk as fast as we walk. We recall Jesus' words from Thursday night about his body and his blood. We remember what happened on Friday when his body and blood were separated from one another at the cross. That's what crucifixion is, we realize. The slow, excruciating, public separation of body and blood. So we wonder, could it be that this holy meal, when we remember Jesus, we are making space for his body and his blood to be reunited and reconstituted in us? Could our remembering him actually be remembering and re-resurrecting him in our hearts and in our bodies and in our lives? Could his body and blood be reunited in us so that we become a new environment? Is that why we saw him and then didn't see him? Because the place he most wants to be seen is in our bodies, among us and in us. It's therefore we reach Jerusalem. Between this day's sunrise and today's sunset, our world has changed forever. Everything is new. From now on, whenever we break this bread and drink this wine, we will know that we are not alone. The risen Christ is among us in us, within us, just as he was today, even though we didn't recognize him. Resurrection has begun. But we are part of something rare, something precious, something utterly revolutionary. It feels like an uprising, an uprising of hope, not hate, an uprising armed with love, not weapons. An uprising that sheds joyful promises of life and peace, not angry threats of a 
hostility and fear. It's an uprising of outstretched hands, not clenched fists. It's a someday we've always dreamed of, emerging in the present, rising up among us and in us, and it's so different in what we expected, so much better. And this is what it means to be alive, to be truly, truly alive. This is what it means to be en route, walking your road to a new and a better day. Let's tell the others, the Lord is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Today, 2,000 years later, we still get to experience that resurrection story over again. I like the disciples that walked that road that first Sunday. We have the history of knowing what happened that Jesus rose again, that his death was not the end. But we still need to feel that hope inside us. We still need to feel that joy that they felt on that day when they encountered the risen Christ. In our lives, we're called to be the body of Christ. We're called to be fed of his blood and his body each and every time we come to our communion services. And that body of blood reminds us that Christ is within us. He's in us. He's here among us. His spirit is alive. And that gives us the power to go on, to live as the children of the light, to be hope in this world that can sometimes seem so very dark. But Jesus calls us to always remember that he is with us and to praise him and to go out to the world and bring that message of hope to people who are living in darkness. May God bless each and every one of you on this Easter season. And the season of Easter doesn't just actually last one day. It continues on for seven more weeks. Because it's such a mystery and such a joy that we can't just keep it consumed in one particular day. So it goes on and on. So may the Spirit of God be with you as Christ lives in you and walks with you on your road or your journey. May he enliven you with his love and may you share that love with each and every person that you meet. God bless you. Hallelujah. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. God bless you all. Stand as we say together the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He is heaven to heaven. And as he that 
our prayers and intercessions. In joy and hope, let us pray to the source of all life, saying, Hear us, Lord of glory. That our risen Savior may fill us with joy of his holy and life-giving resurrection, let us pray to the Lord. That isolated and persecuted churches may find fresh strength in the Easter Gospel, let us pray to the Lord. That he may grant us humility to be subject to one another in Christian law, let us pray to the Lord. That he may provide for those who lack food, work, or shelter, let us pray to the Lord. That by his power, wars and famine may cease through all the earth, let us pray to the Lord. That he may reveal the light of his presence to the sick, the weak, the dying, and they may be comforted and strengthened, let us pray to the Lord. That he may send the fire of the Holy Spirit upon his people, that we may bear faithful witness to his resurrection. Let us pray to the Lord. Amen.
giving thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our right thanks for grace. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of heaven and earth. We give you thanks and praise for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Free is the true past land who has taken away the sin of the world. By his death he destroyed death. And by his rising to life again, he has won for us eternal life. Therefore, joining our voices with the whole company of heaven, we sing our joyful hymn of praise to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna. Give us to say our daily prayer. 
Thank you.